Praise your name, God. your name, O oh God. Praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. The Bible says where there's two or three gathered in the name of the Lord, he's there in the midst of us. And we have our two join in tonight. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our lesson. Hallelujah. So thank you for tuning in tonight. I pray that some others will come on. If they don't, praise God. If they do, praise God. Anyhow, we're going to continue to study our lesson tonight uh, concerning the battlefield of the mind. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss uh, the difference between doubt and unbelief doubt and unbelief so i want to start out with today's devotion from the book more of you god that uh one of my pastor friends his uh wife sister has written a while ago and it says in all sincerity lord jesus today i believe every word you have spoken to me i'm praying and believing for a miracle jesus 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 i need your divine intervention Something supernatural is about to happen in my life. This miracle is going to be substantially benefit my life. Yes, this miracle will be a non-natural phenomenon occurring for, for all for my for good, all for my good. It would take me to another level in you. Lord, the world will speak to me and say it is impossible, but God, I know nothing is impossible with you, Lord Jesus. The possibility and the probability of miracles are all through the blood and existence in my life. I have all I have to do is believe and wait on you while I'm waiting and grabbing hold to more of you, God. Amen. God bless you, cousin Marilyn and Jabbar and Lashondo. God bless you all for tuning in tonight. So let's go into a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this blessed day that you have created. We thank you, Lord God, for the love of God that burns in our heart, oh God, as we desire to have more of you, God. I pray tonight, Father God, that something will be said or done that will inspire, edify, and build us up in our faith to trust you and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are, that, Father God, no matter what comes our way, we're standing on the promises of your word which you have spoken to us. And I ask, Lord God, that you change our thinking, change our attitude, change our lifestyles, that it would be more conducive and surrendered to your lordship and your authority and become more and more like you every day as we walk on this journey with our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we bind every demonic force, every attack, every assault that will come against this word, O oh God, from being spoken and bringing clarity into our insight into the mysteries of the gospel. We ask that you unfold your word, that we have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And we thank you in Jesus' name that the word will bring healing, will bring deliverance, will bring victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all for tuning in tonight. I'm excited about this word. God, God has really been good. It's been so much going on against myself concerning my uh, physical being. But you know one thing about God, he still loves us. He's still in control. And I'm believing God that tonight he's going to speak with, with a clarity and understanding to help us become more aware of the spirit of doubt and unbelief that would try to enter into our minds from the enemy against the word of God that's been spoken to us. I was in a conversation recently with a friend of mine, and uh, we were discussing about Adam and Eve in the garden, 
how when Eve was beguiled and deceived by the enemy, Adam was with her. The, the scripture tells us that he was right there by her. And when the enemy came, Adam released his covering that should have been protecting her from the enemy, but instead he allowed her to be vulnerable to the tactics of the enemy and doubt God's word. And because she doubted God's word, the thief was able to even was able to come and to steal the word that God spoken to both of them and caused them to uh, uh, introduce the fall into the entire creation. But today we're going to discuss the battlefield of the mind, um, doubt and unbelief, because I really believe that God is going to bring us to an understanding and clarity to help change our thinking and our focus to become more like him. The word of God is, is, is bringing so much enlightenment into our lives when we allow it to begin to manifest in us. And the enemy knows that when we get a revelation, he knows when we get a revelation of what God has spoken to us, about us, and for us, he will bring all types of distractions into our lives to hinder us from speaking and living according to the word of God. So many times we find ourselves doubting God's word about ourselves, our belief system, our lifestyles, and we find ourselves drifting back into the things that God delivered us from. And when the enemy puts those thoughts in our minds, instead of casting those thoughts down, as the word says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe it's verse 3, somewhere around there, we, we don't cast those thoughts down. We, we reframe those thoughts and we hold on to those thoughts and we allow those thoughts to dictate to us how we are to live our lives. And that's one thing about God. God wants to break that spirit of the enemy off our minds that we have no excuse and no reason to keep giving in to the darkness of this world. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. Matthew 14, let me turn there right quick. Matthew chapter 13, I mean 14, chapter 14, verse 31. And it says... And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. This is when Peter was walking on the water and he began to sink. And Jesus grabbed him. And, he, and I'm reading a New Living Translation. He said, you have so little faith. Jesus said, why did you doubt me? You know, a lot of times when God is trying to move us into the realm of the unknown in the spiritual world, we begin to doubt God's ability to keep and protect us and to guide us and direct us the way he wants us to go so we doubt his word. When Peter, and this is one thing about this passage of scripture in Matthew 14, when Peter saw uh, Jesus walking in the water, they were terrified. Him and the disciples were terrified because they thought it was a ghost. And one thing about the, the, the spirit of fear it make you doubt the unknown and make you begin to get terrified and begin to question God's ability, question his word. So when he, he saw this ghost coming, but Jesus spoke to them at once. He said, don't be afraid. And he, and he said, take courage. I am here. So Jesus addressed himself that I am the Savior. I'm the Messiah. So, you know, as he began to recognize the voice of Jesus, he said, Lord, if it's you, then bid me to come to you to walk on the water. And Jesus said, come. And so when he began to walk on the water, he began to do something that's out of the ordinary that the natural mind could not understand or perceive. And because of the mindset of the flesh, he was focused in his first endeavor to walk towards Jesus until he got distracted by the wind boisterous or the, the, or the, the surrounding things that were in his, in his atmosphere around him, which caused him to turn away from his focus from seeing Jesus and begin to focus on the surrounding. That's when he began to sink. And we do the very same thing when God is leading us into the spirit, spiritual world to do things for the kingdom of God. He's changing our focus. He's changing our direction. He's changing our lifestyles. But yet we find ourselves looking at the things around us which causes us to doubt God's word, and then we begin to sink back into the places and the things that God delivered us from. All because of a thought. And that's why I love this book, The Battlefield of the Mind, because it's engaging our thought life 
and how to empower our minds to be conducive to the Word of God and allow the Word of God to take hold and get a grip of our thought life to become more surrender and unit to the mind of Christ. And it says, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And he marveled because of their unbelief. And that's Mark chapter 6, verse 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 6. We usually talk about doubt and unbelief together as if they were one in the same. Actually, although they can be connected, the two are very different things. Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament words partially defines doubt in a verb form as to stand in two ways, implying uncertainty which way to take, said of a believer whose faith is small, be anxious through a distracted state of mind of wavering between hope and fear. And that's what happens a lot of times. We waver in our thought and trust in God's word because of distractions. So our minds begin to waver. The same dictionary notes that one of the two Greek words translated as unbelief, and I love this point, unbelief is always rendered disobedience in the revised version of the King James translation. It's defined as disobedience. Unbelief will lead you to, to, uh, to disobedience to obeying God's commands or his word or the things he's spoken to you to do concerning the kingdom of God. As we look then at the two powerful tools of the enemy, we see that doubt causes a person to waver between two opinions, whereas unbelief leads to disobedience. So the enemy uses doubt to cause you to waver in your, in your decision making to follow the truth or to follow a lie. And then unbelief causes us to get into a place of, of disobedience where we don't obey God's word. we rather choose sin instead of choosing righteousness. I think it's going to be helpful to be able to recognize exactly what the devil is trying to attack us with. We are dealing with doubt and with unbelief. 1 Kings <clears throat> chapter 18, verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, if you're taking notes. How long will you halt and limp between two opinions, which is two decisions? I heard a story that will shed light on doubt. There was a man who was sick, who was confessing the word over his body, quoting healing scriptures, believing for healing to manifest. While doing so, he was intermediately attacked with a thought of doubt. After he had gone through a hard time and was beginning to get discouraged, God opened his eyes to the spirit world. This is what he saw, a demon speaking lies to him, telling him that he was not going to get healed and that confessing the word was not going to work. But he also saw each time he confessed the word, light would come out of his mouth like a sword, and the evil spirit would cower and fall backwards. That is so powerful, because I was just in a discussion earlier today with my fiance about how the enemy knows exactly what to speak to us to get us to doubt God as his word. And I was using the same scenario before I even read the book a while ago. I was using the same scenario even today about how when God gives us a word, we ought to cherish that word, protect that word, guard that word, and allow that word to keep being spoken in our ear over and over and over until we believe that word. And when the enemy comes with doubt, fear, and unbelief, we have to know his voice from the voice of the Lord and keep on standing and speaking God's word over our situation, over our circumstances, over our bodies, over our mindsets, over our attitudes, over our character, because the devil is a liar. And if you give in to the voice of a lie, you'll never follow after the truth. As God showed him this vision, the man then understood why it's so important to keep speaking the word. He saw that he did he did have faith, which is why the evil spirit was attacking him with doubt. The enemy knows where your faith meter is. He knows if you're in high faith, mediocre faith, or no faith. 
and he knows exactly when to come into your life to test, try, and prove you to challenge your faith, to see if your faith is genuine or is fake. And you got a lot of fake folk in the body of Christ claim to have faith and have no faith at all because they're doubters. They do not believe God's word if their life depend on it. But they look like they're born again. They walk like they're born again. They sound like they're born again. But in their hearts, they're, they're, they're separated, they're alienated from the Lord and not really following Christ in their life outside of the church. So we got to have a personal examination in our hearts to see where we're lining up in God's word. Is God's word producing life or is producing death on the inside of us? Doubt is, some, is not something God puts in us. The Bible says God has given every man a measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God has placed faith in our hearts, but the devil tries to negate our faith by attacking us with doubt. So the devil knows if I can get you to waver in your faith, I can get you to follow out the doubt. So we got to get within ourselves a stern belief system to not be so easily duped or misled by the enemy because the devil will do everything in his power to destroy your faith. Doubt comes in the form of thoughts that are in opposition to the word of God. This is why it is so important for us to know the word of God. You got to study to show yourself the proof Unto God, a word we need not to be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth. You got to get in the word. Because when you get the word inside of you, when doubt tries to rise in your heart and in your mindset, the Holy Spirit inside of you will remind you of the word of God to stand against the spirit of doubt, fear, and unbelief. If we know the word, then we can recognize when the devil is lying to us. Be assured that he lies to all of us in order to steal what Jesus purchased for us through his death and resurrection. He wants to steal your anointing because it's the anointing that brought the resurrection life, that brought power against the spirit of death that has taken our lives into the place of unbelief, but yet because of the life of Christ, now we're able to receive freely the gift of life that's found in knowing him. I was looking up something earlier and it says, what's the difference between doubt and unbelief? What's the difference between doubt and unbelief? You can't have faith without questions. And the scripture it uses as a reference in number one is Deuteronomy 29, 29. And it says, the secret things belongs to the Lord God, our God, but the things that are revealed belongs to us and our children. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belongs to us and our children. There are some things we will question God about, but we'll never get an answer for it because some things are my myster mysterious to us that is not for us to know at this time. Paul says it like this. Now I know in part, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. We know in part, and that is why we walk by, not by, we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith lives with an unanswered questions. You cannot live in this world without asking why. We live with the mysteries of evil and suffering. And many people... Ask God why you allow us to get afflicted. Why you allow so much killing in the land. Why you allow so much trouble to come our way. Which is a normal response of human nature. To question God. But there are some answers we will not get in this life. We won't get until we get the glory. Just as part of the Christian faith to say we know what God has revealed. It is part of the Christian humanity to say we do not know what God has kept secret. So God reveals certain things to us, and there are some things he kept as a secret. Second, 
you can only doubt what you already believe. This is a very vital and true statement. You can only doubt what you already believe. And that's what the enemy does because we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So he comes to test us with what we already know. He's not going to try you with anything that you're not familiar with, but he comes to test and try and prove you with what you already know. So if you know that the resurrection brought you life, he wants to make you doubt that life. If you know that God delivered you from a certain type of sin, sinful lifestyle, he wants you to doubt God's word and his ability to keep you. Then the third point, doubt and unbelief are different. It is important to grasp the difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is questioning what you believe. Unbelief is a determined to, to a refusal to believe. Unbelief is determined refusal to believe. Doubt is struggle faced by the believer. Unbelief is a condition of the believer. Doubt is struggle faced by the believer. Unbelief is a condition of the believer. So our hearts can be in a condition we just unbelief, don't want to believe nothing God says about us because so much stuff happened in our lives that we question God why and God never answered. So we just give up on God. So you get into a state of unbelief where that becomes part of your lifestyle. And doubt is facing the struggles of, of a believer to know God's word, what God says, but yet you allow the enemy to make you doubt God. That God can't heal God can't deliver. God can't sanctify. God, God can't do this. He can't do that in my life. But one thing I found out about God, there is nothing impossible with God when we believe in him. Unbelief involves spiritual blindness and a determined resistance to God. Unbelief involves a spiritual blindness and a determined resistance to God. Of persecuting believers, Paul said, I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I could not understand the truth, ignorance. I was deeply resistant to the truth, which is unbelief. That, that was his condition. And the only cure for it was, is what happened on the road to Damascus when he was wonderfully converted. He discovered that Jesus is the Lord and the whole disposition of his soul was changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He moved from the position of unbelief to position of faith. So we all have our Damascus experience where God knocks us off our feet. Do we have to fall before him on our faces in repentance and receive him as our Lord and Savior? So it's very important to know God for yourself. There may be some people who feel their problems is doubt when actually in, real, in the real problem is their unbelief. Many people think that their problems is their doubt, but really it's their unbelief. The issue is not that they doubt their faith, but they doubt, it says, but they do not have faith to doubt. They believe, it said they need to believe the things that God has revealed and acted upon. God has sent the Son into the world. The Son of God loved the world and gave himself for you. He has risen from the dead and ascended in heaven. You are more you are more wicked than you ever thought possible. At the same time, you are more loved than you ever imagined. So it's very important to have a repentful heart when you find yourself in a state of unbelief and doubt in the presence of God. Doubt and belief and unbelief. Doubt and unbelief. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations, as he has promised. So numerous shall be your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was good as dead because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah dead in womb. No unbelief or distrust made him waver, doubting questions concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God fully satisfied and assured that God was able, able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he had promised. That's Romans chapter eight, verse uh, Romans chapter four, verse 18 to 21. 
Romans chapter 4, verse 18 through 21. When I'm in a battle of knowing what God has promised, and yet being attacked with doubt and unbelief, I like to read and meditate on this passage. Abraham had been given a promise by God that he would cause him to have their heirs from his own body, have heirs from his own body. And many years had come and gone, and still there was no child as a result of Abraham and Sarah's relationship. Abraham was still standing in faith, believing what God had said would come to pass. As he stood, he was being attacked with a thought of doubt, and the spirit of unbelief was pressing him to disobey God. We all go through the same exact thing. When God promised you a certain thing going to take place in your life, we get into the place where we start out with faith, trusting God that God can fulfill what he promised, but yet when the spirit of doubt and unbelief comes, instead of overcoming it, it overpowers us. So just like Abraham and Sarah, even though it took some time for the promised child to come through their loins, he still did not doubt God's word. He stood on God's word. He believed God's word. He, he, he trusted God's word until it came into to manifestation. Disobedience in a situation like this can, 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 simply can be to give up when God is prompt, prompting us to press on. So in the same situation, we find ourselves in situations sometimes that challenge our trust in God or our belief in God. And it's easier to give up than to keep pressing on when God is leading us by his spirit. Disobedience is, disobedience is disregarding the voice of the Lord or whatever God is speaking to us personally, not transgressing the Ten Commandments. So you got to keep standing on the word of God. You got to keep holding fast to the confession of your faith without wavering. Don't allow the enemy to make you doubt God's ability to fulfill this promise on your life. If God promised you a business and he says that business is going to be successful, you got to stand on that promise. Hold God at his word. Begin to meditate on God's word. Speak that word over yourself until you see that thing come to pass. Even when it comes to healing, sometimes we pray for healing and it never happens in the time we want it to happen. But we got to keep on trusting God in his word, keep standing on the word of God and know without a shadow of doubt that healing is mine because God promised it to me. Don't allow the enemy to get you to the place where you stop trusting God's ability to fulfill his promise on your life. Abraham continued to be steadfast. He kept praising and giving God glory. The Bible states as he did so, he grew in faith. So when you get your priorities in order, your mindset, focus. My radio show that I'm on every week is Focus 2020. And it's very important to have our focus on God's word, God's ability, on the Savior. Instead of on my circumstances or my situations or my problems or things around me because the enemy wants to distort your vision. If he can distort your vision, he can keep you from receiving and walking in the blessed hope that God has spoken into your heart. Just like Abraham, he kept praising and glorifying God until he grew in his faith. You'll, you'll, the key point to growing your faith is to put your focus on the Lord. That you can grow in your faith. And as you praise and glorify God, the Spirit of God inside of you will begin to challenge you to grow. There will a situation will arise in your life that will test your ability to have faith in God. We have faith when we get up that we're going to wake up. We got faith when we go sit in the chair, the chair going to hold us up. We got faith when we go to our job, the job going to be there. We got faith when we get promotions. Why can't we have faith in God? We have faith in everything else but God. And God, just like Abraham, he trusted God at his word until he saw that thing coming to fruition. And we got to have a strong, stern faith in the Lord, unwavering. That no matter what comes my way, no matter what storm of life arrives against me, I'm going to continue to stand on God's word and trust God's ability to fulfill this word in my life. 
You see, when God tells us something or asks us to do something, the faith to believe it or to do it comes with the word from God. You need to write that down. When God tells us something or asks us to do something, the faith to believe it or to do it comes with the word of God. God is not going to tell you to do anything that's not lined up with his word. You might be in a position somewhere that can help somebody else get a job. And the Holy Spirit tells you to help this person out. It's a challenge of your faith. If you're a believer, God will let things come to arise to test you. And sometimes we fail the test, but don't put yourself in a guilt and condemnation, a mindset of, of doubting God, because just because you make a mistake, God didn't count you out. We'll count each other out before God counts us out. We'll turn our backs on somebody else before God turns his back on us. And God wants you to know tonight that no matter what comes your way, you got to keep on standing and trusting God as his word. Satan knows how dangerous we will be with our heart for the faith. You need to write that down. Satan knows how dangerous we will be with a heart full of faith so he attacks us with doubt and unbelief. You got to know for yourself that every precious promise God has spoken to you, it will surely, it's a guarantee, you can bank on it. God will fulfill his word of your life. If God gave you a vision for evangelism or traveling ministry, you got to hold on to God's word Trust God in his word and begin to study the word of God. Begin to seek out the resources to make the thing come to pass your life. And God will show you. God will show you exactly where you need to go, what you need to do, who you need to connect with to make your business or your ministry successful. But the problem comes in when we try to fulfill the call of God on our lives without God. And the more you try to do something without God, the more frustrating it becomes. And I found it out that when God had called me to ministry when I was 19 years old, I still did some things that was not of God's will. Until I began to learn about faith, learn about my identity, begin to grow in faith, grow in the word of God, study the word of God, preach the word of God, teach the word of God, then my mindset began to change throughout the years. It's a process. It's not an overnight thing that's going to happen right now. You got to get to the place in yourself where you desire to want to know God. Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Now fellowship with his suffering and be conformable to his death. That's talking about a sacrifice. The reason why he wrote Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he said, he said, present your body as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God with your reasonable service. Why? Because the most reasonable thing that we can do as a child of God is to die to ourselves and allow Christ to live through us. That's the most reasonable thing you can do. Have faith in God's ability to cause you to die to yourself, that fleshly nature, that fleshly mindset, and begin to live in the resurrected life that's found in Jesus Christ. I get excited about this, y'all. Y'all, excuse me, I can't help myself. I love this word. This is so good. It is not what we don't have. It is just what that Satan is trying to destroy our faith with lies. So everybody have a measure of faith. Everybody have a measure of faith. And some people faith are stronger than others. But it doesn't mean God can't use you. Just because your faith may not be as strong as my faith doesn't mean you don't have enough faith to trust God in his word. Your faith may be a little bit of faith, but he tells us in his word to have faith the size of a mustard seed. And the mustard seed is a very tiny seed, but yet it's so solid and produce a great tree. That little bitty faith that you have, you can trust God's ability to produce a great measure of fruit out of your life. But you got to trust God's word. And here's an example. It says, it's concerned the time when I received my call to ministry. 
It was an ordinary morning like any other, except that I had been filled with the Holy Spirit three weeks earlier. I just finished listening to my first recorded teaching. It was a message titled, Cross Over the other, to the Other Side. Cross Over to the Other Side. I was stirred in my heart and amazed that anyone would teach uh, for one whole hour from one scripture, and that all this teaching would be interesting, and that all the teaching would be interesting. I was making my bed, and I suddenly felt an intense desire well up in me to teach God's word. Then the, then the voice of the Lord came to me saying, you will go all over the place and teach my word, and you will have a large teaching tape ministry. I did not hear an audible voice, but one in my heart that enabled me to believe that I could do what God was showing me. How many times have God came to you in a voice? and spoke to you concerning a vision, or gave you a dream, or gave you something from his word that's gonna happen in your future. He's gonna make you successful. He's gonna cause you to prosper everywhere you go, and you're gonna have good success. But the key point is to stay in the word of God and keep the word in your heart and in your mouth. And many times when God speaks, it's a still, small voice, but it's so profound. And God will speak a word that will challenge your belief system to have that hope against hope, to do not stagger in your faith, but keep growing in faith and trusting God that what he has spoken, he is able to perform it. So we got to have in ourselves a personal conviction every day that when God speaks a word into my heart, I'm going to believe God that word will happen. I'm going to believe God that word will manifest. I'm going to believe God that word will cause me to prosper. I'm going to believe God that it will open doors in my life. It will cause me to find favor with God and with man. Because when God speaks a word into our lives, that word is not just for you alone, but it's for people that are connected to you to help change their lives. But a lot of times, as a believer, we get selfish. We hold on to the word that God spoken to us. We don't share with nobody else to, to help their lives change because I want it all for myself. But one thing about the kingdom of God, it says it may be one body, but yet there's many members. Many members get connected to one body. And if one part of that body suffers, the whole body suffers. There would have been no natural reason at all for me to believe that God had actually spoken to me or that I could could or ever would do what my what I thought I had just heard. I had many problems in myself. I would not have appeared to be ministry material. But God chooses the weak and the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27. God can take the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. In other words, to thwart their thinking, to change their mindset, to change their lives. Because the thing that sometimes God speaks to us doesn't seem sensible. But yet God would take the thing that doesn't make sense and cause it to become sense in our lives to make us be fulfilling the call on our life. He looks on the heart of man and not the flesh. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. And that's in reference into when God was looking for David to be the next king when Saul rebelled against God and lost his position as king. If the heart is right, God can change the flesh. You hear that? Write that down. If the heart is right... God can change your flesh. God can change anything concerning you. When your heart has been changed, your mind has been focused to begin to dwell on the things of God and not the things that will gratify or appease or glorify your flesh. Although there was nothing in the natural to indicate that I, I should believe, when the desire came over me, I was filled with faith that I can do what the Lord wanted me to do. Here's another point. When God calls, he gives desire. 
faith and ability to do the job. When God calls us, he gives desire, faith, and ability to do the job. That's the opposite, the opposite of this. It talks about it in St. James chapter 1. Let me turn it right quick. This is something in my spirit. 1 James chapter 1. Because it talks about desire. James chapter 1. And it says, in the New Living Translation, it says, and remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God never is, God is never tempting or tempted to do wrong. He never tempts anyone. Temptation or desires come from our own desires, which entices us and drags us away. And that's uh, James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And then 15 says, these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. That's the opposite of what I just read in our book. When God calls, he gives desires and the ability, faith and the ability to do the job. The enemy will cause you to follow on the reasoning of the flesh to do what the flesh wants to do. To be driven by desires that will appease the flesh to cause you to give birth to sin. And when sin begins to mature in your life, it kills you. And what God is talking about here, how if we don't obey the spirit of a living God, when he calls us and gives us desire of the Holy Spirit to produce faith, the Holy Spirit produces faith in us and gives us a drive or a driving force in our hearts to fulfill and to do what God has called us to do. And if we don't obey the spirit of the living God, then you're going to obey the spirit of the enemy, which is against God. And the mind of the flesh is an enemy of God. Because every time you give into the desires of your flesh, you're opposing or fighting against God's Holy Spirit to do right. That's where that doubt and that unbelief comes from. Because we allow ourselves to give into the thought life of the enemy. But I also want to tell you that during the years I spent in training and waiting, the devil regularly attacked me with doubt and unbelief. When you're going through the process of learning and defining a call upon your life, no matter what it is, maybe evangelism, maybe apostle, maybe a bishop, maybe a teacher, maybe a pastor, maybe a missionary, maybe a giver, maybe a, a servant, doesn't matter what that call is. The enemy, when you're going through the training process to learn about your position in the Lord, to grow in your position, he's going to come on a regular basis. He's going to send people in your life to test you, to try you, and to prove you, to get you to doubt your ability that God has called you to be who you are. Because he doesn't want you to fulfill that job God wants you to do. So you're going to do everything in his power to fill your heart with doubt and unbelief. God places dreams and visions in the hearts of his people. They begin as a little seeds. They begin as little seeds. God places dreams and visions in the heart of his people. They begin as little seeds. So in other words, we all know what a seed is. It's something to be planted. So God takes the seed of the Holy Spirit. He planted in your heart. Not only that, he gives you the visions and the dreams that he has called upon your life to be fulfilled. So the seeds are being planted it says, Paul, Paul said, one waters, one plants, and God gives the increase. So in the process of your training level of life, God plants these seeds in our lives. Not only plant the seeds, but he begins to nurture those seeds, begin to water those seeds, that those seeds will begin to sprout the roots of the Spirit in your life to be connected to Christ Jesus, where nothing will easily pull you from your faith. That was a mouthful there. But that's how God operates, because the enemy knows that when your faith begins to grow, the roots begin to sprout, and the roots begin to connect 
and becomes a tree of righteousness. And when that tree begins to mature, it begins to produce fruit. And the fruit, Jesus said, your body me, you shall bear fruit, and your fruit shall what? Remain. Because when you are growing in the Lord, you're going to produce fruit from your conversation. That's why it's so important to guard the words that come out of your mouth. You know, I had to repent for something I said today. It wasn't right. You know, I got angry about a situation and God convicted me by the Holy Spirit. I had to repent of that thing. Because one thing about the Holy Spirit, when you know you're out of order and you're a child of God, Holy Spirit going to prune your heart. He's going to pull at you. And he's going to begin to cut away things in your life to, to tell you and show you yourself that, hey, you need to repent. You're out of order. You need to get right with God. And the moment you do that, God gives you revelation. He gives you insight. He changes your thinking. He changes your direction. He changes your lifestyle. So everything begins to line up with God's word. They begin as little seeds, just as a woman has a seed planted in her womb when she becomes pregnant. So we, we, so we become pregnant, so to speak, with the things God speaks and promises. Just like a woman has the seed planted in her to become pregnant, we become spiritually pregnant with the words that God speaks and his promises. During the pregnancy, Satan works hard to try and to get us to abort our dreams. But one of the tools he uses is doubt, and another is unbelief. So he wants you to doubt. He wants you to get to a place of unbelief. Because both of these work against the mind. The very thing we've been talking about for the last several months, the battlefield of the mind, because they work with the thought life. If your thought life is not governed, guided, led, controlled, filtered, filled with the Holy Spirit, your mindset, your attitude will be conducive, be transformed to the mind of the world. In Romans 12 and 2, Romans 12 and 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Faith is the product of the Spirit. You need to write that down. Faith is the product of the Spirit. It's the spiritual force. It's the spiritual force. Faith is the product of the Spirit. Faith is the product of the Spirit. And your Spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit. So faith is in your Spirit. And it's a spiritual force. So if you got the faith of the Holy Ghost inside of you, your faith is going to stay connected to the Savior. And when you're connected to the Savior, no matter what God tells you to do, you'll find yourself willingly being submitted, being yielded, being released into the presence of the Lord to obey him at his word. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to obey me and keep my commandments. If you love the Lord tonight, my brother, my sister, you need to examine your thought life, examine your attitude, examine your heart to see if you've been driven and you've been leading by doubt and unbelief in your heart by the enemy and allow that spirit to be broken off your mind that you can come back to the place of righteousness and truth as you yield Submit and release yourself to the will of God. The enemy doesn't want you and me to get our minds in agreement with our spirit. The enemy doesn't want you and me to get our minds in agreement with, this, with our spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. He knows that if God places faith in us to do a thing and we get positive and start consistently believing that we can actually do it, then we will do considerably damage to the kingdom of darkness. We will do damage to his kingdom. The enemy knows that when you and I get ourselves in order and line it with God's word, begin to walk in that word, stand on that word, believe that word, devour that word, think about that word, speak that word over ourselves, we can do damage against the kingdom of darkness. The enemy knows that. Here's a, it said, but the boat was by, it said the boat was by this time out on the sea. 
many furlongs. A furlong is one eighth of a mile distance from the land, beaten and tossed by the waves, for the waves was against them. And this is talking about keep walking on the water. Keep walking on the water. And in the fourth watch, between 3 and 6 o'clock a.m. of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. But instantly he spoke to them, saying, Take courage, I am. Stop being afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. This is an amplified version. And he said, Come. So Peter got out the boat and walked in the water and came towards Jesus. But when he perceived and felt the strong wind, he was frightened. And he, as he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me from death. Instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and caught and held him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus has the ability to save you in no matter what situation you find yourself in. You must keep walking on the water of faith. Keep walking towards the Lord with a heart that's steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord until you get a revelation of who he is and what he's doing in your life to change your life. Just like Peter. When he, he grabbed him by the hand, as he cried out, Lord, save me. Who are you crying out to tonight? Are you crying out to the Lord? Matthew 14, verse 24 and 32. Are you crying out to the Lord? Or are you crying out to your family? Are you crying out to your friends? Are you crying out to your associates? Are you crying out to your pastor? Are you crying out to everything but God? If you change your perspective and recognize that who I've been crying to does not have the ability to save me. Only God can save me. He will grab you by the hand of faith. He will pick you up from your pitfall of despair. He will put you right back on the right track and lead you to the boat of safety. And then the storm or the wind will cease in your life. He has the ability to speak peace in a dark place, to give light in the darkness. But you got to want him to come into your life. Get a one who coming to your heart. Because it's so important to step out in faith, in obedience to what God has commanded you to do and do not down your heart. But believe that those things which God has spoken will surely come to pass. When you get a chance, read Mark 11, chapter, verse 22 to 26. And I guarantee your faith will begin to be built up from the word of God. And one vital point it talks about, if you do not forgive your brothers of their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. If you got sin against anybody in your heart and you haven't forgiven them, you hold them in response with something they've done to you or they said to you, you must repent, ask God to forgive you, and ask that person to forgive you. And allow the Lord to change your attitude, to become more and more like him in obedience. And I guarantee your life will be more fruitful and abundant in the kingdom of God. We're going to pick this up next week because I really believe that God has something for us even more out of this chapter. I'm on page 99 in the book, The Battle for the Mind, in the Kindle version. I'm not sure what, what page it is in the regular book, but in the Kindle version, it's page 99. But you stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus. Keep the word before you. Keep the word in your heart. Keep speaking the word. Get in the word. Study the word. Speak the word over yourself, over your family, over your children. And allow the word of God to build their faith as your faith is being built. So, Father, I thank you tonight for the word that you've spoken. Pray, Lord God, that you change our thinking, change our attitude, purge us from fear, doubt, and unbelief. Build us up in our faith as we trust you at your word, that your word will surely come to pass in our lives, and it shall manifest to produce a fruit of true righteousness in our lives and out of our lives for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know the Lord and Savior tonight as your Savior, I want you to repeat this prayer after me, Heavenly Father. Come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. And be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you 
for saving me. Now fill with the Holy Spirit and that with power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. So I pray that something has been said tonight that would encourage you. Keep standing on God's word. Trust God in his word. To walk by faith and not by sight. Don't allow the enemy to victimize you and cause you to get into a place of doubt, doubting God's uh, his word. Because I guarantee God's word will surely manifest and come to pass in your life as you walk by faith into the unknown realm by the spirit of a living God. That God will give you clarity and understanding, give you wisdom, give you knowledge, and give you insight into the mysteries of the gospel. Until next week, God bless you. Stay excited about Jesus. If you decide to sow a seed, I'll put the link on here again to sow a seed into the ministry. If this ministry is blessing you, feel free to sow a seed. And in the process, expect God in return for a harvest to come into your hands. Because one thing about God's word, when we give, as God has, has spoken to our hearts to do, he promised he will open the windows of heaven, pour you out blessings. You don't have enough room to receive. Call your barns to be filled with plenty, and your vast overflow with new wine as we trust him at his word. Until next week, be excited about Jesus and know that I love you and God loves you too. Shalom. Have a good night.